The Prime Minister is uh, visiting uh, Eastern Europe uh, next week. Do you think that the government's doing enough to protect the Ukraine from the depredations of Mr Putin? Look, I think the Prime Minister is right to go and visit the region. We've criticised him for not going, and I'm not going to criticise him now for going. This is an incredibly difficult, volatile and serious situation. I think the Defence Secretary is absolutely right to offer support, um, support around intelligence, support around defensive capability. I, if, if I had one disagreement with the government, listening to Liz Truss there, it was that it was quite extraordinary that she on the one hand, was emphasising the importance of widening the sanctions regime, something we've called for for a long time, and working in concert with our allies in order to implement that. It has far more effect on Russia and on President Putin if we stand together in the face of Russian aggression. But just minutes later, she was talking up a row with the EU that the government has been trying to keep going for the last few years. It seems to me these two things are completely contradictory and most of all not in Britain's interests. They're certainly not in the interests of the people of Northern Ireland, but you can see now why this is not in Britain's interests as a whole. The, the issues around the protocol could be dealt with with some creativity and goodwill and I think the government really ought to reassess the way that it's handled that in the light of this very serious situation that's developing on the border of Ukraine. So, but broadly speaking, you, you support what they're doing. Um, would there be things that you would do in addition? Yes, we've long called on the government to widen the scope of the Magnitsky sanctions. These are sanctions that apply to individuals. And it, when the government introduced like what them, Liz they watered it, down. Forgive me, it sounds from what Liz Truss said that that's actually what they're about to do. Would you, will you be supporting legislation if that's what the effect of them, that legislation is? If they do, we've campaigned for it for several years. We pushed the government to do it originally. And I think my understanding was that that was blocked by the Treasury. If the Treasury has finally realised that that was a mistake, of course we will support that. And I think the important message from Britain has to be that we stand united in the face of Russian aggression with NATO and with our allies. We will not allow this to stand and all political parties should be working to that end. There is a tricky um, uh, issue to solve here. There, there worries that the Kremlin might put the squeeze on by restricting ga gas exports to Europe and a, a third of uh, uh, Europe's gas comes from from Russia. Market prices are already incredibly high. They're going to go up again. Uh, we are going to face our own problems. Um, do you think the UK can actually afford to do what is necessary? For example, Liz Truss more or less said if there's an invasion that we should uh, put, uh, put a stop to Nord Stream 2. Do you think we can afford to do that? Well, I think there's two things. The first is that we've got to work very closely with countries like Germany that are heavily, much more heavily reliant on, um, on ga imports of gas from places like Russia to make sure that we're all working together around this. And I agree with Liz Truss that um, economic expediency cannot come before security and the defence of the United Kingdom and the defence of democracy. But, you know, for over a decade now, we've had this very, very confused energy policy that's been pursued by the government. We've lost a lot of our gas storage capability that was given away several years ago. We haven't invested um, sufficiently in... Um, in renewables, particularly around solar. The government took the axe to solar a few years ago and removed the subsidies that were that cut off at the knees an industry that was really thriving and developing, jobs, jobs growing at six times the rate of the wider economy. I think we're now starting to see the folly of that approach being played out um, at the border of Ukraine. And that's one of the reasons why we've been saying for some time now that not only would investment in renewables um, and in the energy industry and in helping energy intensive industries to adapt do a huge favour to many parts of the country that desperately need to see new jobs and investment and good wages in them, but that 
at the same time, it would help us to cut carbon emissions and reduce our dependence on imports of gas from, company, from countries like Russia and Qatar. That's got to be the right approach. And I hope that finally, after a decade of inaction, the government is going to wake up and realise that this is critical to our national security and critical to our future prosperity. All right, let's, uh, if I may, uh, uh, let me catch up with, uh, with history and, and move on from your old job to your current job, which is Sharon, Shadow uh, Leveling Up Secretary. You, you praised the, um, the government's uh, desire for levelling up uh, and in places like Grimsby, where you and your leader were this week to look at investment uh, that's taking place in offshore wind power. Um, do you want to see, what do you want to see more of in the levelling up white paper? Well, look, we, we welcome the small pots of money that have been announced for 20 places today. That's a, a, a small refund on the amount that we've lost since the Prime Minister took office. And I think those 20 places will be glad to have any penny back that they can get, because any penny counts. But I think there is a profound sense that the government has really missed the point with the very small uh, beer that they've given us this morning. They've got to get money back into people's pockets. Right across this country, town centres are, are not thriving. High streets are falling apart because not only have we seen good wages, good jobs depart from many parts of the country over recent decades, it's been turbocharged in the last 10 years. And right now, energy bills are going up, shopping prices are sky high, and people are about to face a tax hike. Michael Gove talks about King's Cross style regeneration. But if you want King's Cross style regeneration, you've got to put money back into people's pockets so that they can spend. You've got to get those good jobs back in. King's Cross cost three billion to redevelop. The government's stake alone was worth three times what they're giving to the entire rest of the country with this money that's been recycled from the budget. These are places that, within living memory, powered this country. Places like Grimsby, places like Wigan. Yes. And we deserve the right to make that yes. contribution again. That We are ambitious for this country. Why isn't the yes. government? Oh, yes, but I'd, I'd like to ask you, Lisa Nandy, what, what would you do? I mean, when you uh, talked about levelling up this week and, and previously you've got uh, p particular interest in the position of towns, um, one of the things that you've said is that you don't want people to have to get out to get on, that they don't have to leave where they've grown up and live in order to get good jobs, to be socially mobile and so on. How do you want to achieve that and what's it going to cost? So we want young people to have choices and chances and we've already made a significant commitment from a future Labour government as to what that would mean. £28 billion investment every year for the life of the next parliament in green energy. That means the sort of jobs and apprenticeships that I saw in Grimsby with Keir Starmer last week, the sort of chances and choices for young people that are too often denied to them. Unless we take that seriously, unless we get that investment back into places, the transport infrastructure, the digital infrastructure, so that we can leverage in private sector investment, it's businesses in Grimsby that have been driving that improvement and getting that investment into Grimsby and those opportunities back again. Unless we do that, unless we rebuild the foundations of our local economies and allow people the chance not just to have jobs but good jobs again that make a contribution we will have profoundly missed the point that's what the, is so disappointing about the government's announcement today we've got yes. to be far more ambitious than that yes you've been, okay let's you've, you've been saying for a couple of weeks now that the whole party gate saga and so on has been distracting the government um two weeks ago you said the prime minister's position was untenable um but he's still there. The delay around the Sue Gray report and the Mets launching its own investigation probably mean that actually that's going to be the situation for some time, possibly for months. Has Labour missed its shot at the Prime Minister? Look, the Prime Minister could end this uh, circus today. He could just be honest about yeah, what has been going on. You and on. I know he's not going to. He, you and I know he's not going to. Your job as opposition, if you, as the way you describe it, is to get rid of him. Have you missed the opportunity? Did you fumble the ball? 
Well, look, in the end, it's, it's up to two groups of people, Tory MPs who could, if they wanted to, trigger um, for the Prime Minister to go or back a vote of no confidence in the House of Commons. But I think it's unlikely... A vote of no confidence moved by the Labour Party? Or, or it, it will move by the Labour Party if Tory MPs will support it. There's no point in just perpetuating the circus. People have got real problems. But, or, or it's up to the public. In the end, the Prime Minister, if he stays, will have to face the public in a general election. But just consider for a moment what you said, Trevor. We just agreed and moved on very quickly from the idea that the Prime Minister could put an end to this, be honest and come clean, but he's not going to. That is why this circus is continuing. That is why the country is being held back. That is why this yeah. levelling up white paper, frankly, doesn't appear yeah, to be it, worth it, the paper that it's okay. written on. These promises yeah, that have been made to us are not being kept because the Prime Minister it's, it's not, is saying yeah, that but he needs not, a criminal investigation to tell him whether he was even I get, at a party. I, I get mean, it, but it's not, my, it, it's, it's not my job to make moral judgments about the Prime Minister. What I'm asking you sure. is, if you think it's all so terrible, he's so ghastly, he's making a mess of the country, why haven't you been able to do anything about it? That's the job of opposition. And I'm just asking you whether you think... Uh, when you had the opportunity, you missed it. Well, I just, I don't know what you're asking me to do. Do you want me to go down to London now and frog march him out of Downing Street? I mean, in the end, we live in a democracy, and if Tory MPs won't find the backbone and the courage to do the right thing, then it will be up to the British people. What we'll do as the official opposition is leave no stone unturned. We will not rest until people who have been bereaved, people who've lost loved ones, people who made huge sacrifices, have got answers from the Prime Minister about what was going on on his watch and we'll continue to do our job in speaking up for people who are watching these broken promises with utter dismay. People deserve better chances and choices than the ones that are currently on offer to them. They, deal, they deserve a government that will deal with the cost of living crisis and will actually start to rebuild our great towns and cities right across this country. And until they have one, we simply will not rest. That is our job and we will do it.